Hello and welcome! In the modern times, overclocking became very popular and today I would like to talk about the time where overclocking was more than just a fancy challenge. Why do I say challenge? Well, the thing is that the hardware became quite sophisticated, the CPUs got all kind of features, more and better cache, special commands, branch prediction, vectorization and so on, which improved the performance in many ways. All these made the hardware more complicated and the performance less linear dependent from the frequency. That's why squeezing another megahertz out of our CPUs became more and more just a challenge for itself and not a necessity. In the time where 10 MHz CPUs did almost cost as much as a car, an overclocking by just 5 MHz meant gain of 50% of performance and saving a lot of money. This significance shrank more and more as time was passing by, however in the mid of 90s overclocking still was a matter of money. Also a matter of be able to play a game or not. Computers were outdated a lot faster than today. You just couldn't play a new game on a one and a half year old computer. Buying a new machine was for the most people, especially younger ones, not an option at all. So overclocking was an absolute necessity. But when did it start to be more a challenge than a necessity? The important break in time was the Pentium MMX. Practically all CPUs before that, when overclocked by let's say 25%, were also around 25% faster in everything they did. The multimedia extension by Intel, better known as MMX, was the first CPU instruction set which could improve runtime performance of an application. The first CPU with MMX technology was the Pentium MMX with 166 MHz. If the application was compiled with support for MMX, it could run a lot fast on this re CPU regardless of the same frequency. So this was a time where frequency started to be misleading as a performance indicator. However, not all CPUs would handle MMX and the software adopted this technology quite slowly. So we didn't see a real benefit of the new CPU instructions for quite a long time. And the frequency kept to be ultimate indicator up to Pentium 3. Today's better mainboards provide all kind of overclocking features. We can set up voltages in almost all components separately. We can set the front side bars and multiply timings for memory, rotation speed and profile of a fan. It got very comfortable to overclock and meanwhile we have even software which gives us a way to set all these things on the fly without even have to reboot the system. We live in amazing times and people are taking on this challenge and squeeze more and more hertz out of the hardware. Even using custom cooling system with liquid nitrogen and so on. However, I would like to leave the challenge of overclocking a modern CPU to another specialist and would like to go back in time where overclocking by a percent meant linear performance increase to the hardware. Before it was possible to set all kind of things in software, there were jumpers for the front side bus, voltage type of CPUs and all the other stuff. This is probably already quite old school for many of us, but it is still too fancy for my today's topic. Today, I would like to talk about how overclocking was made on 286, 386 and early 486 machines, where jumpers were not yet the state of the art. Take a look at this 386 mainboard. I really like this mainboard and it served me good for different experiments in the past. It has Intel 386SX CPU with 16 MHz soldered to the board. 16 MHz is a guaranteed frequency of the clock signal which the CPU should stand. But nobody said that this can be overclocked. Ok, but what defines the clock frequency which will be used to drive the CPU? On the main board of this age you will find a crystal oscillator near the CPU or the chipset which usually delivers the double frequency of the CPU. On our main board there we have a 16 MHz CPU and here you can see the 32 MHz crystal oscillator. Let me start this main board and take a look at some benchmarks. In landmark speed test you can see that the CPU is detected as 15.932 MHz 386 SX. We are getting 21.21 CPU points, so this machine runs as about 21 MHz AT. Season 4 also tells us about 16 MHz 386 SX and shows 11 points in the benchmark. Interesting is that NSSI detects the CPU as 16 MHz AMD, despite that it is actually Intel. But in the benchmark it is nearly as fast as a usual 386SX16 with 3942 points. So to overclock the CPU we just have to exchange this oscillator 
within U of higher frequency. 40 MHz oscillator for 20 MHz CPU clock, 50 MHz oscillator for 25 MHz, etc. The crystal oscillator on this board is soldered, so I have to desolder it first and add a socket to be able to try different oscillators and frequencies. First, let's just try the whole thing again with the original oscillator, just to be sure that everything is still okay. Looks good, nothing has changed, and we have our 15.932 MHz again in the landmark speed test. Okay, now we are coming to the interesting parts. We are finally ready to overclock our CPU. Let's see which crystal oscillators I have. This is the original 32 MHz oscillator to run the CPU at 16 MHz. Here I have 66 MHz oscillator, which could supply 33 MHz clock to the CPU. This would mean 100% overclocking and would be probably too much. So let's see what else I have. Here is 50 MHz oscillator, which would overclock the CPU by around 56% to 25 MHz. This is also quite a lot, but we will see if it would really work. Unfortunately, I have only these three oscillators and nothing between 32 and 50 MHz. This could be a problem. But let's start with what I have. 50 MHz oscillator for 25 MHz CPU clock first. Unfortunately, this seems already to be too much for this 16 MHz CPU. The machine starts, but crashes every time trying to boot DOS. So I guess we will not be able to go so high. Well, I'll need an oscillator with a lower frequency. Maybe 40 MHz would be a good start to get the CPU to 20 MHz. Therefore, I'll salvage a clock generator from another 386 donor board. This AV9155 can deliver different clocks from 4 up to 100 MHz. It just needs a 14 MHz crystal and can be easily configured using three jumpers. I desolder it from the donor board and use a simple breadboard to stick everything together. The breadboard can be easily connected directly to the crystal oscillator socket I previously installed on the main board. For the start, let's just set up 32 MHz on our breadboard and get 16 MHz on the CPU to verify that everything is working stable. Booting DOS wasn't a problem and in landmark speed test we can see that the CPU is now at slightly higher frequency of 16.636 MHz instead of 15.932 MHz as it was with the original oscillator. Anyway, everything seems to be stable and we can move on rising the CPU clock to 20 MHz. I set up the clock generator on the breadboard to give us 40 MHz and power on the computer. DOS booted just fine and in the landmark speed test we are getting almost perfect 20 MHz clock. But the most interesting part is that the CPU points rose from 21.21 .21 at 16 MHz to 26.53 at 20 MHz, which is a perfectly linear performance increase. The same is in SysInfo. The increase is also perfectly linear from 11 points to 13.9. And last but not least, NSSI went from 3942 almost linear to 4699 points. After running Doom benchmark at 20 MHz for about 15 minutes, the system remains stable, despite that this game is just too much for a 386SX and it is more a slideshow than a game, it is still a good stress test and as you see the temperature went up to 48 degrees Celsius. It is quite hot but still in limits. So, with uh, 20 MHz we got a quite good improvement. With 25 MHz, however, the system became too unstable to boot and with 33 MHz it just refused to start at all. My question is now, if this is the CPU which can't handle the frequencies above 25 MHz, or is it the main board? I have an idea for which I already hate myself. As I told, I really like this main board and it already had a stressful life with me, but what I'm going to do now is beyond good and evil. However, my curiosity is just too much to not to do this and I'm going to replace this CPU. 
On the donor board from which I got the clock generator, there is also a 33 MHz 386 SX AMD CPU. The original 16 MHz CPU is an Intel, however the 386 AMDs were a drop-in replacement for Intel and are completely identical. It is socketed, but unfortunately I can't move the whole socket to the other main board since it is through hole one and the main board I'm torturing has only surface mounted pads. So I have to desolder the 16 MHz CPU and solder the 33 MHz instead. This 33 MHz CPU should run with the 66 MHz crystal oscillator. Let's see if we get there. I don't even know if it's working at all, but well, what can go wrong? I will use a heat gun, so to prevent the original CPU from overheating, I'll put some masking tape and cover it with captain tape. I want the heat to be concentrated on the legs of the CPU and not on the die. The area around the CPU will be protected with the same double layered tapes. After adding enough flux, I'll also go over the contacts with roses metal, which should lower the desoldering temperature as much as possible. And now it should be ready for the heat gun. With all the preparations, it took just a couple of seconds to get the CPU off the board. Now it is time to clean the pads and with a lot of flux, bring some fresh solder on them. Soldering SMD parts with such tiny and fragile legs is not the simplest job. Should you do this, take a lot of flux or you will run into a complete solder mess and will have to use a lot of solder wick whatsoever. Just believe me, you don't want to get that far. It can also be quite tricky to get all the legs from all sides properly aligned on the pads. It is a lot simpler to solder one or two legs on one side and then get the another side aligned properly and solder again one or two legs there and so on. When all sides aligned, just add a lot of flux and go over the contacts with just a bit of solder on the tip of the iron. With a bit of experience and a lot of flux, it is a doable job. I will put the original 32 MHz oscillator first into the socket to check if my solder job was OK and if the CPU is working at all. This looks good, we are getting the same results as before with the 16 MHz CPU in landmark speed test. Funny enough, in NSSI we still see the CPU detected as AMD, but this time it is even true. Ok, back to overclocking. Let's try the 50 MHz oscillator first and see if the system can boot this time. And it looks good. This time the system booted just fine. As you see in landmark speed test, we are getting 24.999 MHz clock and 33.39 CPU points instead of 21 we had at 16 MHz. This is again perfectly linear performance gain. In season 4 we are getting 17.3 instead of 11 points and in NSSI 5628 instead of 3942. Well, unfortunately, the mainboard completely refuses to show any signs of life with 66 MHz oscillator, so I can't measure the performance of the CPU at 33 MHz. Off camera, I tried to make some investigation, measured the clock on the ISA bus because I thought that it could be overclocked, but it was running perfectly at 7.16 MHz. I also tried another memory with lower latency, but couldn't find anything what would help. At 33 MHz the mainboard was like dead and after a while I even encountered rare instability at 25 MHz. So I guess 25 MHz is the absolute limit for this mainboard and it is not made for higher frequencies. Interesting enough, in the online documentation I found that this mainboard is specified for 16, 20 and 24 MHz CPUs. This is quite strange, since there were no 24 MHz 386 SX CPUs as far as I know. But I think the chipset UM82C366 is just limited to that clock speed. If you have a mainboard with this chipset and a CPU running above 25 MHz clock speed, please write into the comments below.
Anyhow, let's take a look at the values I could collect with this system so far. As you can see, in all tests, we are getting almost a perfectly linear performance gain with rising CPU clock. This is due to a relatively simple architecture of the CPUs from the time. However, keep in mind that back in the day, every megahertz was a direct indicator for the performance of a CPU and the prices grew up exponentially. Such an improvement, as we see here, could cost thousands of dollars. That's why many people started to exchange the crystal oscillators for a couple of cents to get more out of the hardware, and this is how overclocking began. Well, and this was a short story of how overclocking took its first steps. As I told before, I really like this mainboard, which I tortured so much for this experiment. Just to calm myself and the purists of you out there, I restored the board to the original state, putting back the 16 MHz CPU. I just left the socket for the crystal oscillator in place, just in case, you know. And the 33 MHz CPU will go into the box as a replacement part to the time where I really need it and can use its full speed. So far, I hope you enjoyed it. As always, please leave your feedback below and don't forget to leave your likes or dislikes to let me know what kind of content you are interested in. And I hope to have you on my channel again. Thank you and goodbye.